morning, good morning. I hope you're doing well. I am not Mark Lanier. Somebody said, is that excitement that I hear over there? No, I'm sure. I'm sure Becky Lanier is relieved to know that, right, that I'm not doing. My name is David Capes, director of the library. Uh, Mark is not here today. I wish he, wish he were. I always love hearing Mark teach. Um, I'd rather hear Mark teach than me teach, because I already know what I'm going to say. So, uh, you know, that's how it, gets, how it goes. Always, and he always surprises me with something. It's just amazing. I've been doing this now for a number of years, but he uh, is often very surprising. We're talking about snapshots of Jesus. And if I can get this thing working here, there, there was the flash. There was the flash again. Okay, is it going to work? There you go. How do you see Jesus? That's an important question, don't you think? In fact, that may be the most important question that you and I will ever ponder. How do we see Jesus? How do we understand Jesus? And this book, I want to just say just a word about the book. The book is not brand new. It's a couple of years old, but it's here and available for you. But one of the things that we did is uh, if, we, if we don't have enough copies, we'll get some more. Uh, and we'll make those available to you through the library, the Library Foundation. But one of the things that we did is we wanted to ask the question here at our time, who is Jesus for Mormons? Who is Jesus for Muslims? Who is Jesus for America? What about the Gnostic Jesus? What about the cinematic Jesus? The Jesus we see on film. Now, this was before The Chosen, which I hear is amazing. How many of you have seen that? All right, do you recommend it? How many recommend it? Most of you, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, and then we do, you know, obviously the Gospels and those kind of things. But part of what we want to do is we have Muslim neighbors. We have Mormon neighbors. I've got a conversation going right now with a, a fellow who's a Mormon. And having written that chapter and worked on that, it helps me to understand a little bit about my neighbor, my new friend, that I'm going to be, be working with and talking with and having perhaps down to the library at some point. We'd love, love to see that happen. So anyway, make sure you get a copy of that. Um, how we see Jesus is very often a function of our culture. Sociologists have been telling us that for quite a while. If your DNA, if your ancestors came from there, from Germany or Italy or the United Kingdom or, or any of the countries there that you see, the chances are pretty good you're going to see Jesus like this. Have you ever seen this picture? Probably the most famous picture, Warner Salmon, early 40s I think he painted this. And, there, and at, when we wrote the book, there were about 50 million prints of that, that image. I saw it in Sunday school classes in a variety of churches where I was able to attend or teach. I saw it all the time. Now, if your DNA and your ancestors have come from Asia, China, and the East, the chances are pretty good you're going to view Jesus something like that. Really. Notice the character of the face. Notice the texture of the hair. If you ask people from Asia, how do you see Jesus? It's very culturally determined, right? Now, if your ancestry has come from Africa, if your DNA, if you do ancestry DNA, or what, what is that, what are those? National Geographic did it a few years ago. Comes out of Africa, there's a good chance that you're going to imagine Jesus, see Jesus like this. I've had conversations with people. Tell me, for sure, this is how Jesus would have appeared. But it's not just about where you're from. It's about when you are from. If you're a millennial or 20-something or maybe a 30-something, this is how you might see Jesus. Here's a billboard. Jesus all tatted up. Jesus taking on the sins of the outcast and the addicted and the lives and suffering for them. If you are from Texas, there's a good chance you'll see Jesus like this. I guarantee you there's a concealed handgun there somewhere. 
I don't know, left side, right side, maybe the back. I don't know. But the, my, my point is, is that where we're located physically, where our ancestry is, where our time is on kind of how old we are, is very often affected by and will affect how we understand Jesus. Now Mark, not Lanier, but the gospel writer. Mark, the gospel writer, lived at a time when he saw Jesus very much locked in conflict because he himself and his community was locked in conflict with people around them. That was a part of it. So Jesus had told his disciples, expect trouble. And boy, did they have it. Expect to be persecuted. And boy, did they have it. So Jesus is locked in conflict for Mark. And we see that from the very beginning. Remember Mark talked about how the very first opening chapter is kind of the heaven's view of Jesus. And then very soon after he's baptized and he hears the voice, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Very soon after that, Jesus is driven by the Spirit into the wilderness where he is tempted, where he is with the wild animals. Still trying to figure that out. What does that mean exactly? And then Jesus begins preaching and teaching. The kingdom of God is near. It's approaching. It's getting closer and closer day by day. He's telling us that. And he's preaching and making disciples. And he begins to confront disease. He begins to confront demons. And then we're only about 8% of the way in the gospel. And Jesus has these conflicts with people. In fact, Mark brings them all together in chapter 3 and chapter 6 in conflict stories. Scholars call them pronouncement stories because they're so very crafty and clever. Because there's a number of stories, I say that tongue in cheek, there are a number of stories that start out sort of what in this form. Jesus says something or does something. He is criticized for it and challenged, and there are people charging him with things like blasphemy and other things. And then Jesus has a pronouncement. Very, Jesus has, for Mark, the last word to straighten it all out, to make it all clear who Jesus is and what his mission is all about. Now, we can't look at all six of those. I think there are six. Some scholars say that there are five. I think there are six. But Mark sees Jesus locked in conflict. Now, here are the three charges that I want us to consider that are leveled against Jesus today. The number one is that he is a friend of sinners. We're going to come back to that. The second charge leveled against Jesus is that he is a Sabbath breaker. Observing the Sabbath is about the most Jewish thing that you can do, you know? And the final charge, the most serious charge is that Jesus is in league with the devil. And we're going to look at all three of those. We're going to analyze those, spend a little time with each one of them. But we're going to look, start, first of all, with that first one, that he is a friend of sinners. And we're going to ask the question, how like Jesus are we in that matter? So here we go. Here's the text. Jesus went out again beside the sea. You see the Greek on one side. And all the crowd was coming to him and he was teaching them. And as he passed, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, Akaluthemoi, follow me. And the man, Levi, got up. He left the tax booth and he followed Jesus. Jesus is calling disciples. Some people think this is probably Matthew. Each disciple goes by various names, and everyone had a, a nickname, it seems. <laughs> At least the, and here's where the charge is made. Now, the charge is in blue, and I have brought back, because I love it so much, the red letter edition. Is that okay? Red letters are what Jesus is saying. As he reclined at the table in his house. Now, this is kind of interesting. Scholars don't know what to make of this, because already Mark has told us that Jesus has a house in Capernaum. Mark Lanier made the case that it was probably Peter's house. Maybe, but I'm not sure. Still, he has some house. It's not really his. It's probably rented quarters. And as he is reclining at the table, 
There are tax collectors. There are sinners there reclining with Jesus. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with these folks, sinners, tax collectors, they asked the question to the disciples, not to Jesus. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, and here's the pronouncement, Jesus is there to straighten it all out. Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners. That's my, that's me. That's who I am. That's my mission. If you think you're right, if you think you're righteous, if you think you're okay, you probably don't need me. But the people who know they're sick, who realize that they are, their bank account spiritually is at zero, those are the people who are looking for the great physician. Well, I want to just kind of parse this, and I want to remind you that tax day is coming. April the 15th, that's your public service announcement. April the 15th, Internal Revenue Service wants to hear from you. Please make sure you do it by then. That's the end of my public service announcement. I want to distinguish what Mark would have us distinguish, Mark, the gospel writer, have us distinguish, between sinners and sinners. Now, you and I have democratized the idea of sinner. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're all sinners. Have a good day, right? We all need to be saved. Indeed, indeed, indeed. But when Mark uses that word sinners, he uses it in a sense of a big S kind of sin. Notorious sinners, bad sinners, public sinners, people who lived in shame in the community because of their sin. Those are the people that Jesus invited to his house, to his table, to have a meal together. And I'm wondering about us as I think about that, as I say that, I wonder about us. There's the tax, just one more time, the tax, tax man is coming. Well, Take a look at this passage. Right, let's take a look at a couple of pictures here. I love this. I love mosaics. I would love to just my house to be filled with mosaics. Here's a mosaic of the ancient world of people feasting together, reclining at the table. And here's a picture today of, of a modern feast. That looks good. I was looking at that fried chicken earlier, and that, I got hungry. I love fried chicken. Haven't had it in a long time. But I'm asking it this question. Who is it that comes to your table? When's the last time you had a notorious sinner seated at your table? When is the last time that you invited someone who lives in shame because of what they've done, who they are for some reason? It was a woman who was sitting in church one day, and the pastor said, now next week is going to be a very special day. I want you to bring all of your lost friends, because we're going to have a important day. We're going to share the gospel. And on the way out of the church, you know, people, people used to, on the way out of the church, shake the preacher's hand. Do they do that anymore? Not, not a lot of places, but some places they still do. I get to do that from time to time as I'm preaching somewhere. It's coming out of the door, and sometimes they'll say things to you, and they'll talk about the sermon. And this morning, this, this, this lady walked out and said, Pastor, I don't have any lost friends. And he looked at her, and he said, How unlike Jesus you must be. Now, I'm not talking about just all of our lost friends. I'm talking about notorious sinners, public sinners. When's the last time they've been to your... Now, I'm saying that to me, too. Because if we really want to be like Jesus, we can't just surround ourselves with Christians all the time. People like us. You would be a lot more interesting people if you had some sinners at your table. You'd probably have better stories, wouldn't you? I'm wondering how like Jesus must we be if we don't have really some friends who are sinners. Big S, not little s. Sinner like me, sinner like you. 
Who makes it to your table? I want to encourage you to think about that. I want, you to, I want to encourage you. This is not the first time or the only time that Jesus is charged with being a friend of sinners. All of Luke chapter 15, we're told. Luke chapter 15 begins. I wish I could show it to you, but I don't know how to use all this stuff. Mark didn't show me. I'm, I'm going to push something that's going to explode or something. But Mark, Luke chapter 15 begins with the charge that Jesus is a friend of sinners, and he tells three stories. One's the story of a, a man with a lost sheep. The 90 and the nine are safe, the one goes off. And another is the story about a woman with a lost coin. And the other is the most famous, the last, the most famous, the longest, is the story of the prodigal son, right? Why are you a friend of sinners? And he says, because heaven rejoices when one who is lost is found. Jesus said, that's why I'm a friend of sinners. And I'm a friend of sinners because if you go back and read the text, he said, those are the people that I came for. Those are my people. Because they live with the shame and the guilt and they are coming to me. I want to encourage you to have some sinners at your table. Not just at a restaurant table but it's your home table. And the other thing I want to encourage you, and it's hard, when invited, you go to their house. You go to their table. I love Christians. I love being around Christians. I have so much in common with Christians. But I tell you what, I have some great conversations with people who aren't. I can tell you some, but I don't have time. Wish I did. Now, here's something I came across as we're thinking about this. These are the top 20 most criminal names. Is your name up there? Here they go. Jeremy, Johnny, Randy, Terry, Bobby, Billy. I'm, I don't see a David up there. Jason, Jerry, jo a lot of J's. These are, out of 100,000 people, the number of people who have been arrested with those names. Eleven, Justin, Jose, Brandon, Jesse, Christopher, Roy, Juan, Brian. That's my middle name, spelled like that. Larry and Michael. Larry, you're in trouble. I don't know why. I thought that was interesting. Do you have any friends with those names? Invite them to dinner. You never know what's going to happen to them next. Here's the charge level against Jesus. The charge level against Jesus, he was a friend of sinners. Who says that about you? Who says that about me? Am I known? Are you known to, as being a friend of sinners? Jesus' response, I came for these people. That's why I'm here. If you think you're well, if you think you don't need a doctor, fine, good. Go live your life. I came directly for those people who know they're sinners, who know they're tax collectors, who know they're traitors to their own people. I came for those people. Now, I could begin to ask and say, well, what, what, what kind of people today? And we would probably fill the air with all kinds of suggestions. Somebody might say Democrats. Somebody might say Republicans. Somebody would probably say racist. All kinds of people that we could begin to call. Have they been to your home? Have they been to your table? If you want to be like Jesus, you'll be known as a friend of sinners. It's a hard lesson. I'm not there yet. I'm working on it. I am working on that. I want to be known for that. I think I'll be a much more interesting person if I have some friends who are sinners. Now, here's the next one. Here's the next one. Who is Jesus? He's a friend of sinners. Here's the next one. Let's see. I'm trying to get it. There we go. Now, on one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their ways, the disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying now to him, Look, why are they... 
and you're responsible for what they do. Why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath day? Here's Jesus' response. A lot of red here. Jesus said, have you never read what David did when he was in need and he was hungry and those who were with him, his, his entourage, his protectors? Come back to that in a minute. How he entered the house of God at the time of Abiathar, the high priest. He ate the bread of the presence. It's not lawful for any to eat except for the priest. But David also gave it to those who were with him, his fellow soldiers, And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. There's a lot there, a lot to sort of understand. If we're going to understand this particular text, we have to go back to how it all begins. One of the top ten commandments, commandment number four, is this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you are to labor, do all your work. But on the seventh day, it's a Sabbath to the Lord. The word Sabbath means seventh, by the way. On it you shall do no work, not you, not your son, not your daughter, not your male servant, not your female servant, pardon me, or your livestock, or the sojourner who's in your gate, the stranger. You can't send somebody to do your work on the Sabbath day. That's how it all begins. Now imagine, just for a second, that you're a Jew. And imagine that you really do believe that God said this. And you really do believe that it matters. What do you do? How do you live your life? Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Do no work on the Sabbath. Well... There are really two questions that you have to answer if you're going to do this. The first question is, what day is the Sabbath? So, so I, I'm a professor. I like people to talk to me when I talk. So I'd like for you to talk back. What day is the Sabbath day? I heard two answers. I heard Sunday, and then I heard Saturday. Let me try that again. What day is the Sabbath day? I heard Saturday more often than I heard Sunday. Now, I want to set aside for a moment the idea that Christians very often call what the early Christians call the Lord's Day, the Sabbath. I'll set that aside. That's a whole other talk. But for a moment, let's stick with the idea that the, that, that the seventh day of the week is Saturday. You know, calendars used to be sort of On this side, Sunday, and all the way down, what was the last day of the week? Saturday, right? Now, I've seen more and more business calendars that start the week with what? Monday. And then the seventh day of the week in that way is is Saturday. But actually for us, for Christians, the first day of the week, the day of creation, the day of new creation is Sunday for a lot of reasons. So what, day is that? so what day is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is Saturday. But there's another question. Now, we're going to come back to that. Um, the second question you have to answer is what is work? Remember the Sabbath day, right? Do no work on the Sabbath day. So you've got to know what work is. I mean, imagine that you really think God said this. Imagine that you really think that it mattered you got to know this. And so Jews went about thinking and reasoning and wondering and debating this issue. What day is the Sabbath? Now, I want to just propose something for you and just get you to think about it. When does our day begin? What, what, time, what time does our, our day begin? 12 p.m. Uh, 12 a.m. Midnight. Who thought of that? That seems to be a dumb idea. I don't like that. I'm asleep most of the time. I should be. You should be too. So the day begins in the middle of the night. Is that right? Who thought of that? Now we're not legalists, of course. 
But take a look at these. Two infants, twins, born in different years, born in different centuries. One was born at the very end of the 20th century. The other was born 15 minutes, minutes later at the beginning of the 21st century. We're not legalist, are we? One's a tax deduction. <laughs> One is not. We're not legalist. Well, I don't know how those things work out. I guess the IRS can be reasonable sometimes. I don't know, or, or maybe not. Now, here's, here's the question that, that Jews had. When does the day begin? When does the day end? If you're going to say it's the seventh day and you're going to take that seriously, think God really meant it, then you've got to ask the question. When does the day begin? Now, they didn't have day beginning at midnight. They, they followed the Old Testament. The Old Testament says evening and morning is the day. So day begins in the evening. I like that idea. That's usually when I'm going home and hanging out with my wife and having a good meal. Hanging out with my dogs and kids. I like the idea of the day beginning in the evening. Wish we could reclaim that. But what is the evening? When does the day begin? According to Jewish reckoning, what do you think? Six o'clock. Okay, wrong. I'm sorry, I'm just, just teasing. Uh, it could be, could be six o'clock. What else? Sundown. What is sundown? Define it. End of the day. That's, that doesn't help. When is sundown? Can you define it? Can you, can you imagine for a minute that it matters? Okay, here's, here's one way of thinking about it. Let's see if I can get this right. Uh, imagine that line. Can you see that line? It's a blue line, thin blue line. The thin blue line represents the horizon. All right? And so the question is, if you're a Jew and you're really, you're really trying to take seriously, God's saying, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy, do no work. And you've got to think about this. When does it begin? When does it end? All right, here's the sun. And is this, this sundown when the sun touches the horizon? I see some heads shaking. Is this sundown when the sun is halfway through the horizon? No. Is this sundown when the sun passes all the way through the horizon? Is that sundown? See, it's different every day. It's different everywhere. What if you're in a valley and there's a mountain to the west? Is it when it touches the horizon or when it touches the mountain? Because that matters. You ever been north of the Arctic Circle? No? Some of you have. What if you're a Jew living north of the Arctic Circle? Sun comes up and just goes like this. <laughs> right? During the summer? That's what happens. So what do you do? How do you think about what a day is at that point? I mean, it's a pretty important question. Let me give you one answer. If I can find my glasses here. Uh, it, was, it was given to us by the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, this is kind of cool because how many Sunday school classes you get to read from the Dead Sea Scrolls? Here's, here's their answer. This is a document called the Serek HaYahad, which means the rule of the community. It means the order, this is how we're going to order our lives together. And this is what it says. No man shall work on the sixth day from the moment when the sun's orb is distant by its own fullness from the gate of the horizon wherein it sinks. For it is God who said, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So did you get that? I'm not going to read it again. But let me tell you, let me show you what it looks like. It looks something like this. To make sure that you're not working on the seventh day, you stop working on the sixth day. Makes sense. Imagine you're out in the field and, and you got a little bit more weeds in the field and you, and you see the sun going down and you start hoeing the row and hoeing the row and hoeing the row and hoeing the row and, hoeing the row and you look up and the sun's gone. Happens pretty fast, doesn't it? Oh man, it's working on the Sabbath. So this is what they said, the fo folks who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. You stop work 
when the sun is above the gate of the horizon, the distance of its diameter, basically. The, that's when you stop working. Just to make sure you're not found to be working on the, Lord, on the day of the Sabbath. So that's when you stop above. It was a way of building a fence around the law, they say, would say. Now, let's see if we can go this. So the Mishnah, let's talk about work. The Mishnah has 39 characteristics or 39 categories of work. We'll look at those in a minute. Dead Sea Scrolls describes a number of actions prohibited. Jesus and his disciples basically violated it two ways. Number one, they were traveling abroad on the Sabbath. Number two, they were harvesting grain. Really? That's how it was understood. Let me show you. Let's see, how can we do this? So the question, what is work? Why is it doing that again? Here we go. Shifting. Okay. Mishnah. Mishnah is a Jewish document from about the time of Jesus, a little bit later. Rabbis debating and making pronouncements about the law, trying to take seriously. And I applaud them for trying to take seriously God's law. And they were in these sort of legal battles back and forth, asking the question, what is work? So the Mishnah has 39 categories. Not going to give you all 39. But a lot of them have to do with just life and the transporting an object from inside the house to outside the house, not permitted on the Sabbath. You can't carry something into the house that was outside the house. You can't move something from one place to another. You can't kindle a fire, cook food, pasture an animal, pl plow, reap, bake, sow, wash, any of those kind of things. Anything's related to agricultural life, pretty much were prohibited on the Sabbath. You always cooked the head so that you could eat what you already had prepared. And even today in Israel, if you go there, you'll realize that uh, in some places, that's what happens. People still follow by that. Now, it, the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, they had a, um, I want to go back to that same document and read to you what they said was involved there. These are the things that are prohibited. This is work. No man shall speak any vain or idle word on the Sabbath day. That's pretty much everything <laughs> we say on the Sabbath day. It's just Guys, just don't, don't even talk on the Sabbath day. You shall make no loan to a companion. You shall make no decision about matters of money or gain. Say nothing, you, should, you should not talk about work that is to be done, labor that is to be done. Remember, these people take this stuff seriously. No man shall walk abroad to do his business on the Sabbath. He shall not walk more than a thousand cubits beyond his town. That's a uh, thousand, half, 500 yards, something like that, away from his town. You shall eat only that which has been prepared before. You shall eat on the Sabbath nothing except which has already been prepared. You shall eat nothing that is lying in a field. That's where the disciples of Jesus, right? It was already in the field. You shall drink nothing except that which is already in the camp. So you've got to haul your water the day before. If you're on a journey and you go down to bathe, you don't drink. You should only drink where you stand, but not draw water into a vessel. You shall send out no stranger to do his business on the Sabbath day. You shall not wear soiled garments. Garments brought, brought to, uh, to the store, unless they have been washed with water and robed with incense. No man shall willingly mingle with others on the Sabbath day. No man shall walk more than 2,000 cubits after a beast to pasture it. No man shall take anything out of the house or bring anything into the house. Same rules. No man shall carry perfumes on himself. Whilst going and coming on the Sabbath. He shall neither lift sand nor dust in a dwelling. No man who is minding a child shall carry it while going in and out on the Sabbath day. So only women, in a sense, were allowed to carry ch children on the Sabbath day. It goes on and on. When Kathy and I moved to uh, Texas back in, boy, no, no, yeah, first time, uh, years ago, uh, we, 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 were in, we were going to seminary, we were going in this truck, we had this big truck, we were driving this truck across the country from Atlanta to Fort Worth. And we got to Fort Worth, and we got to our apartment, but the truck was just full of our stuff. We were just so tired from driving two days, and we were just, 
So we said, okay, let's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a Piggly Wiggly right next door to us. And so he said, okay, let's go get some food. So we went in and we, we got some beans to eat. And we got a can opener. Now you may not remember this. We got up to, to check out. And we put our stuff there. We got two or three other things. And put our stuff on the belt, moving up. And the person behind the ridge said, I can sell you the beans, but I can't sell you today on a Sunday the can opener. <laughs> I'm serious. I can sell you the beans because it's food, but I can't sell you the can. Those were the, sort of the rim, uh, what's, what was left over of the blue laws. Remember the blue laws? We still have a few of those today. Now, those kind of things are built in. We, we take them for granted in a way. But my point is, is, is that people took this stuff very, very, very seri seriously. We have to understand it within that kind, kind of idea. Now, here's the charge level against Jesus. He breaks the Sabbath. Nothing more Jewish, nothing more law-focused than Sabbath observance. And Jesus broke the Sabbath. He, he was a Sabbath breaker. But what did Jesus say? Essentially, his response was the, sir, the Sabbath is a good servant, but a bad master. He actually says, and I love, I, love, I think I, my translation is a little better on this, is that, let's go back. You guys need to see this. No, no, no. Don't, go, don't do that. Those of you who study Greek with me, you need to see this. Going way back. Come on. Oh, wow, I'm going way back. Way back. The sun. Oh, the sun is moving up. I'm sorry, we're going too far back. I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to change all this in a minute. Here, here it is, though. This is, the, this is what I want you to see. Over here, the Greek. Jesus says to him that the Sabbath came about because of man, humanity. In other words, the Sabbath is important, but it's there for us. And not did man come about to keep the Sabbath. Jesus sort of turns things on his head and, and he makes it okay. He says it's okay when you're hungry to eat on the Sabbath, wherever you are. It's okay to travel. These are just disputes among Jews about how to keep the law. And Jesus would do good on the Sabbath. Now, Jews today will say pekuach nefesh, which means basically the saving of life oversees everything. In other words, it's okay to feed people on the Sabbath day. It's okay to do certain things on the Sabbath day, but you still have to remember the Sabbath, keep it holy by doing no work on the Sabbath. But Jesus, according to their rules, and their understanding was the Sabbath breaker at that moment. All right, we got to go way forward here. Let me get back to where we were. Here we are, I think. Nope. Mark is so much better at this than I am. He's super, he's super good at this stuff. And I'm trying, to, I'm trying to learn it. I can't move it any further. All right, here we go. Mark, if you're watching this, you got to teach me how to do this. All right. Here we go. What did Jesus say? The Sabbath is a good servant, but a bad master. And I, Jesus, am Lord of the Sabbath. That's a pretty lofty claim to be Lord of the Sabbath. Now, here's the last. Here's the, we're moving along. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. We're going to say more about that in a moment. Here's our text, though. Uh, I think we're going to skip that one. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul. And by the prince of the demons, he cast out demons. Now, this is in response to Jesus' exorcisms. It's clear that Jesus has been in conflict with these demonic spirits. And they're not doubting that. They're saying, in a sense, yes, Jesus is doing some fantastic, some amazing things. They're not doubting what he's doing. They're saying that he does it by the power of Beelzebul. Beelzebul is just a name for the devil. 
goes, it's kind of a name that goes way back into the, it means, it came from a root that really means Lord of the Flies. Some of you might remember that. But this is what he said. He's possessed by Beelzebul. Now, the other thing that I want our Greek students to know is that this is an imperfect form of elegon. In other words, this is what they kept saying. They were trying to change the narrative. The narrative was in public that Jesus was a great teacher. He may even be the Messiah. This is what people were saying about Jesus at the time. But they were trying to change the story. Uh, yeah, not really. They, were, they kept on saying over and over again to try to change the narrative. This was one of their talking points, if you want to use that analogy. Their talking point was that, yeah, Jesus is doing some amazing things, but he's doing it by the power of Beelzebul, not the power of God, which is a deep, deep charge indeed. And he asked the question now, and Jesus speaks, how can Satan cast out Satan? If the kingdom is divided, it cannot stand. If the house is divided, it won't be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he can't stand, but he's coming to an end. So Jesus engages, first of all, in a little bit of logic. A house divided cannot stand. It cannot stand. But he goes on. And he tells his parable. And here's the parable. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed, he may plunder his house. I was reading this text with some students at HBU a few years ago. And I said, well, what is this about? Who is the strong man? We like strong men. We admire strong men. That's got to be Jesus. Jesus is the strong man. Who's the robber? Robbers are bad people. Got to be the devil. Got to be Satan. In fact, turn that around. The strong man in the story is Satan. He's the one who Jesus is plundering. Jesus enters into his domain, into this world. Jesus recognizing this conflict, but he is binding the strong man. That's what Jesus is up to. One after the other. When Jesus casts out demons, he's binding the strong man. When Jesus heals the sick, he's binding the strong man. When Jesus teaches that the kingdom of God is coming, he's binding the strong man. Jesus is wrapping the strong man up so that he can plunder his world, so he can take it back. Because we had given it over to him. So there's a lot of images there we could hold. But he is binding the strong man. It's important teaching. People have gotten that wrong many, many times. Because we, we, we so admire strong men. I don't think I have time to tell this story. What time is it? I can't see, my, I can't see the clock. 10.20. 10, 20. Okay, I have time to tell this. I was on a flight one time with uh, going, to, uh, going to Detroit. And on the plane, there stepped a guy who, who I recognized. It took me a minute to figure out who it was. He sort of filled up the plane as he came down. And I realized it was a fellow named Rulon Gardner. Now, anybody that follows wrestling will understand what I'm talking about. A number of years ago in the Summer Olympics, there was a big Russian who kept beating all of our best wrestlers. And then Rulon Gardner stepped on to the mat. He was, a, he was a lot shorter than the Russian. But finally, the Russian could not beat Rulon Gardner. And Rulon Gardner won the gold medal that year in wrestling. One to nothing, was it? And so our, our planes, we, you know, we got off the plane. And we, we, I, I just said, our, you're Rulon Gardner, right? Because I'd seen him before. And he, he, we, we got to talking a little bit. And our, both of our planes going to the next place were late. So we began talking and chatting. And I asked him about his life. And he had already won the gold medal. But he, he's a Mormon. He lives in Utah. And he had been out uh, snowmobiling at one time. And he got caught in a snowstorm. And he got frostbite on his feet. Now his feet, he can't feel his feet anymore. So he was trying to figure out how to wrestle again. He went back to wrestle. He, he won a medal the next time, but it wasn't the gold. 
But it was kind of interesting to be there. This strong man. And, and he said, we we're standing there in the terminal, I think Terminal C in Detroit. And he, and he put down all of his stuff and he said, let me show you something. So I have a new stance. And so he got down like he was wrestling. And I was sitting there, am I going to be okay? <laughs> Is he coming after me? This huge hulk of a guy we admired and we do admire. Jesus is telling us, Mark is telling us that this world is not the way it's supposed to be. It's a world that needs to be taken back by the word of the gospel being proclaimed, by healings being done in the name of Christ, by other miracles that are done, but also just the day-to-day -day living as a friend of sinners, as a person who takes seriously the scriptures, and as a person who understands that the world is not the way it's supposed to be, but it is becoming that and will become that under God's good hand. Well, one more time, there's our lames, just to be reminded. The charge leveled against Jesus He's in league with the devil. He belongs on his team. Seems to be on our team, but he's on the other team. He's a traitor. And Jesus' response is, I am plundering his world. I'm taking it back one leper at a time. One demon-possessed man at a time. One dead girl at a time. I'm taking it back. And we are taking it back. We who believe in Jesus, we who are living the gospel, we who are a friend of sinners, we who are ma matching in our lives. So who is this Jesus? He is one. This is, this is a great, I love this painting. It's a painting by Cezanne. If you want to give me something for Christmas, give me that. <laughs> I love Impressionist painting. But it's, a, it's, it's, it's about, the, it's about the, the house that is plundered. That's what he had in mind as he painted this particular place. And so Jesus is the robber who's plundering Satan's world. This world is not the way it's supposed to be. You and I are to be living counterculturally to everything. We are the true uh, subversion of culture for the sake of Christ. Well, I think my time is about up. Finally, friend of sinners... Lord of the Sabbath, taking back the world. One person, one miracle, one sermon, one teaching at a time. That's how it happens. It's not our work, it's God's work, but we work with him in, the, in, that, in that good blessing. That today is our snapshot of Jesus. Let me pray. And it's time to go worship the one true God. Father, thank you for these good folks, for their patience and listening, for the technology that worked when it does work, but also the opportunity to think in Scripture about what it means to be a friend of sinners, what it means that we are to take seriously the Scriptures, even as the Pharisees did, even as the scribes of the Pharisees did. To think about it, to debate it, to analyze it, to come up with something that helps us live our lives more meaningfully and more purposefully in this world. And then to see Jesus as the one who is able, because none of us are, to truly change this world. Speak to us this week. Help us to become who Jesus is, that his life be formed in us to be his hands and feet and mouth and life here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.